Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining for this exciting session for our Jewish clergy justice mission. For the past week, more than 70 Jewish clergy from across the country have been learning with us about anti-hunger issues, challenges for anti-hunger policies, and opportunities in the time ahead. We've had dozens of Hill visits with members of the House of Representatives and senators for Jewish clergy to share about the importance of smart and effective policies to end hunger in this country. As we get toward the end, we're going to have a great discussion of what's next for the anti-hunger movement. And we're so pleased that you're able to join us. Uh, my name is Josh Protus. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at Mazone, a Jewish Response to Hunger, and I'm thrilled to introduce our session today. Um, we have a great discussion with Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky and Stephen Krikova, and it's my pleasure to introduce them both. Congresswoman Schakowsky was elected to represent Illinois' 9th Congressional District in 1998 after serving for eight years in the Illinois State Assembly. She is in her 11th term. Congressman Schakowsky serves in the House Democratic Leadership as Senior Chief Deputy Whip. She is a member of the House Democratic Steering and Policy Committee, the House Budget Committee, as well as a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, where she serves as Chair of the Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee and as a member of the Environment and Oversight and Investigations Subcommittee. Congresswoman Schakowsky has been a true anti-hunger champion and a great friend of my own. I was looking back at some old pictures back from, I think, nine years ago uh, when I joined her at the Capitol Hill Safeway to do shopping for the food stamp challenge uh, where participants purchased a week's worth of food. Back then it was $1.25 per person per meal and it's only slightly more now. Um, she's also been a regular attendee of Mazon's uh, National Hunger Seder event on Capitol Hill. Um, and joining her in conversation is Stephen Krikova, who serves as a, on the board of directors for Jewish Family and Children's Service of Minneapolis. He's a member of Adath Yeshurun Congregation in Minnetonka, Minnesota. And Mazon is very pleased to have Steve as a longtime board member and a chair of our Government Affairs and Public Policy Committee. Uh, professionally, Steve is a retired director of government relations for Land O'Lakes, a uh, farmer-owned cooperative based in St. Paul, Minnesota. He was responsible for leading all advocacy efforts on federal and state legislation that affected the cooperative or its members, primarily food and agricultural issues. And I know we're in for a real treat for a robust and engaging conversation between the Congresswoman and Steve. So I'll turn it over to them now. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Um, Congresswoman uh, Schakowsky, uh, on behalf of Mazon, we are so pleased to have you uh, with us today. And um, um, let me uh, start by congratulating you on being reelected to your 12th term in Congress. Um, our, as Josh said, our organization appreciates the working relationship that we have with you and your staff. And um, we appreciate your support for the uh, policies and programs to address hunger in America. So on the subject of the election, um, please uh, share with us kind of your significant conclusions um, about the uh, outcome of the election nationally um, and, and how it looks for uh, anti-hunger activism in the, in the uh, weeks and years to come. Overall, good. I think many people exhaled maybe for the first time in four years. Um, thinking that we are definitely heading into a much more positive um, environment when it comes to uh, ordinary people and people who are really suffering right now. And the suffering is just so extreme. We had a, uh, an unusual number of adults, women and men, weeping into the telephone um, during this uh, COVID period. Um, and one woman who was crying and also kind of apologetic, saying that she needed help. She can't feed her family right now. So we were able to uh, direct her to a shelter. I mean, I, I'm sorry, direct her to a pantry uh, in the community. But the fact that volunteerism, which is great, and we want those food pantries and all the help that the, pri the, public's, the private sector is giving, but in this richest country in the world, it is just shameful, immoral, 
that we have so many people. Four in 10 families right now are saying that um, they are struggling with affording basic necessities of, of life. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the numbers are just staggering of people who can't afford the food. 18% of black families, 17% of Latino families compared to 7% of white families um, are, are saying that they're having trouble, really, that there's food insecurity. So I, I can only believe that with a, a, a compassionate president that we are absolutely going to see a change in policy. In terms of passing legislation, um, you know, Steve, that we're gonna have to wait and see um, what's gonna happen in terms of the majority in the Senate. Because, you know, I'm in the budget committee and I have, I have been in budget hearings where you, you can see and feel the contempt dripping from the mouths of some of my colleagues and the instituting of a um, requirement for work in order to get the SNAP program, the, 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 the food stamp program, as it used to be called. Really? They have to prove themselves to, in order to get food for their, for their families in some way, and especially at a time when there's no jobs. Fortunately, there was a, a court that has put a stay on that, that states you know, cannot require work requirements. But you know, so the short answer, it's a good outcome. That's uh, very encouraging to hear. Um, as we kind of look at the election results, are there certain members of Congress that you are either, um, uh, that you're going to, that are leaving Congress either voluntarily or because of the election results that uh, you're gonna miss working with? Well, you know, first of all, let me just say that, um, you know, we were hoping actually to expand our majority right. in, the, in the House of Representatives. And some of us were just, Kind of surprised to see um, how many Americans decided that four more years of Donald Trump would be a good thing. Um, so we have to we have to address that. Um, I would certainly miss Lauren Underwood from Illinois, but it looks like right now, as the votes are coming in, that she is ahead and is going to you know will be okay. I I will miss Donna Donna Shalala. Um, yeah. Much. You know, she brought um, a lot of not only um, expertise, but uh, she's just, a, you know, such a delightful person and a great spokesperson um, as the former head of um, the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so, um, but all of them, I will miss all of them um, because, um, you know, we have a, a somewhat diminished minority a majority, excuse me, a majority that, which is still good. It's always good to be in the majority, but we won't know the outcome of some of the elections for another while yet. And we may do, be doing better than we thought. Sure, you mentioned how the uh, pandemic has um, caused uh, more and more families in America to be um, food insecure, uh, hungry, not being able to put enough food on the table for their families. And uh, one of the uh, key points that Mazon has uh, emphasized in the past is that the voluntary sector, the food pantries and food shelves are great, but we, re we really need a solid safety net um, for uh, um, hunger relief and food security in the future. So one of the, we, have, along with others in the anti-hunger anti community, have been pushing to increase the SNAP uh, benefit, um, both the minimum benefit and um, the overall benefit uh, hoping to get that into the the next uh, COVID relief bill. What's the outlook for that? Well, there does seem to be more movement in getting something um, that would provide some relief. Um, Mitch McConnell said it was job number one to do a, uh, a relief package um, in this lame duck session. Um, and um, even and the White House has said they, they want to do things like um, unemployment insurance and the um, Paycheck Protection Program, uh, PPP, which can help businesses um, to, to thrive. And our emphasis would be on smaller businesses and mom and pop stores and et cetera. Um, but they, 
have not really been um, active in when they have made proposals in including nutrition in there. Mm -hmm. We were able to get um, eight uh, billion dollars um, in some more money for nutrition, but we we need we need more than than that. And what's going to happen um, in uh, as we move ahead on um, the um, funding for this year, so we don't end up with uh, a shutdown uh, again. That's one of the undone things. We're still going to work to put more money for nutrition into um, the um, appropriations bill so that uh, we can address this. But let me just give you an example how bad it is in terms of COVID. 15% of adults living with children report that their children didn't have enough to eat in October. Compare that with last December when 1% of adults said that. So the, we, we are seeing the direct consequences of this uh, COVID situation, the, the, the virus, the pandemic, um, that is really depriving our, our kids, our families of the, uh, of the food that they need. This is just completely unacceptable. So we have to make extraordinary efforts, not just ordinary efforts to make sure that we keep funding the SNAP program and the emergency programs, but we have to do extra right now. I'm talking to you from Minneapolis and um, our governor just is tightening up or shut, help, shutting down more of the um, activities that are allowed in the state or promoted in the state. And um, um, we just lear learned that our, the school district where we live in is going now to complete remote learning. and. While that's great from a public health standpoint, it raises the question about all the children who rely on the school lunch program in order to um, to meet their daily uh, nutrition requirements. And it, it's going to be a real challenge up here in Minnesota. How are we going to get those children fed? Everywhere, um, you know, we're seeing these outbreaks and um, these surges of the virus all over the country, and that is going to be an increasing problem as states like, uh, like mine um, begin to look at more um, shutting down so that people are at, uh, at home. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drastic situation. And so far, uh, we have not seen any leadership and from um, the, the president, from the, the, from the federal government. Um, and fortunately, we're seeing now already that President-elect Biden has set up an, or a, a um, they don't call it a task force, but an advisory committee on what to do about mm -hmm. crushing this virus because it's, um, it's deadly in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, you are a co-founder and serve as the co-chair of the uh, Democratic Caucus Task Force on Aging and Families. Uh, and in that role, you've been a champion on issues that uh, particularly affect older Americans. Uh, they also have been a priority for my zone. Uh, what should we be pushing for in the next Congress to address the needs of older Americans and families? Well, it's a, it's a broad um, range of issues because the United States of America doesn't really have a long-term care policy, period, at all. Families are, you know, find themselves trying to um, figure out what to do um, you know, getting access to home and community-based services is really going to be um, number one. And of course, that includes providing food. Um, you know, we have uh, the um, Meals on Wheels um, programs um, and, you know, which actually have been derided from some of the leadership in the um, Trump administration. But, you um, you know, we need, we're going to need far more. Um, we're going to need to address the problem of nursing homes, where, which have been about 40% of the deaths in Illinois. It's over 50. In, wow. you, you've had a problem in, in Minnesota. Yes. With uh, deaths in, in nursing homes. They all too often 
are kind of death traps. And, you know, so just reviewing the whole issue of long-term uh, care facilities and nursing homes um, is gonna be incredibly, incredibly important. The um, country is aging um, every day, 10,000 more people turn um, 65. And so um, we, we have to do some serious looking at um, the variety of policies. But if we could, if we could draft a, and, and conceive of an overall long-term care policy so that the future was, and the options were much clearer than they are right now, um, that would be really, really important. Yeah. You, um... Josh mentioned in the introduction that I used to serve on the board of Jewish Family and Children's Service in Minneapolis. And to me, that's a perfect example of a public-private partnership. Um, th that organization has um, great programs for congregant feeding in some of the senior, re uh, senior residences ar around the, the Twin Cities. And something like that, we should be looking for ways to promote and use that as a model. Absolutely. D uh, adult daycare programs. I know our Jewish Federation sponsors uh, those and the Children and Family Services. Is, you know, it's just, it's so essential. So we do have role models on how we, uh, we could proceed. Great. Um, so looking a little further ahead, what do you see as the longer term dynamics around big legislative matters? Things like the annual budget and appropriations process, and then some major policy bills. Um, the farm bill, of course, affects the SNAP program, and that's up for uh, renewal during, if not, well, if they're going to start the process in the next Congress. Right. Um, what's the long term outlook for major policy considerations? Well, I think once again, what is possible is still under question because it's going to have a lot to do with what happens in terms of party. Uh, domination of the of the Senate. Um, you know, if if the Democrats were to have the House, the Senate, and the White House, the sky really is the the, the limit. And we could um, begin to undo some of the bad things that have been the hurtful things that have been done to um, to, to people. And then we could go forward and you know, just craft long-term plans that could could really could really help, um, and and so I think the the election certainly has has been a so far seems to be really positive in the way of executive orders that I think all of us ought to be thinking about. Certainly, um, the Trump administration has used executive orders in a way mostly I think that is been discriminatory often and harmful. Certainly our immigrant populations have suffered. We're gonna see big changes there. Um, the, um, the going, going forward in general, the, the, the um, president-elect Joe Biden has said that we're gonna rejoin the Paris Accord. We're gonna rejoin and begin funding again the World Health Organization which is important in our own self-interest, not in just the interest of others as he sees the, the rest of the world. That is that, uh, the, that uh, Trump does. Um, I think we will see an increase in things like the, um, the, the SNAP program. Um, so that, and you know, hunger is a choice. It's a decision. There is no physical reason why people in this richest country in the world, in this most abundant country in the world, need to go hungry. It, 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 it actually is just a definition of the kind of inequities that we have in, in our country that, that we could solve. And God bless the zone for the work that, that it is doing. I, I should have started with that. And I want to say that at every opportunity. You know, I am so proud to come to um, the Hunger Seder um, every year that is held in, in the Capitol. And the invitation that goes out to members, I wish more would come, 
and more of, of both parties would come to really understand the um, mandate that we should feel as legislators um, to, to make sure that our kids and, and, and no one in our country um, goes, goes hungry. But I believe that due to the election that we're going to have an opportunity to examine all of those uh, policies. You um, talked about the Farm Bill. You know, um, people think about the Farm Bill is that we need to help farmers, especially family farmers. Um, that's a, a mixed bag. But all of the nutrition programs are in the Farm Bill, and that is so important. Um, and the leadership of that committee is going to be important um, because our, uh, our, our current uh, champion, uh, uh, well, he has been a yeah, champion. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, lost his, uh, his election in your state. Yes, I know. A, a big loss for our state. Uh, Colin Peterson, uh, Peterson is yeah. not here anymore. Yeah. yeah. Or won't be there anymore. Yeah, I know you don't serve on the Ag Committee, but uh, with a, a new chair coming into that committee, uh, David Scott from Georgia um, will be the first African American to be to chair the Ag Committee, and from certainly from a nutrition standpoint, Marsha Fudge from Ohio, being the continuing, I hope, as the chair of the nutrition subcommittee, really show, gives us a chance to have some. Um, advocates in leadership roles uh, on that committee as they do begin work on the farm bill. Exactly, and you know, certainly all of us that uh, care so much about this uh, issue, someone like myself who has um, participated in the food stamp uh, challenge on a number of, of times. Mm -hmm. one, one time with Fox News mocking me because my tuna salad just looked so delicious. <laughs> That, oh, what's the problem with that? Kind of, you know. <laughs> Sad. Um, so, at thinking about um, how we achieve um, systemic change um, in America and in our society, what levers of power can and should be wielded to help create change and move us toward a more just and responsive society? You know, we've seen some really important awakenings, I think. In, in the last while, um, the, the, the death, the murder that everyone saw on television of George Floyd, we, we sat with him as he died. Everyone saw it. And it, and it ignited this movement of de demanding not just in, in the, the regulation of the police, although it did prompt a bill, the number of people who hit the streets. And the impressive part of that was it wasn't just black and brown people. It was um, people of, you know, white people, people of all ages that, that actually took to the streets at some risk given this uh, pandemic right now to say, no, we will not tolerate this injustice that expose, has exposed itself in such high relief during this time of COVID. You know, we're seeing African-Americans and um, Latinx people die um, much more frequently from COVID-19 than white people and people of means. Um, and, and we, so we, we, we are seeing people that are in danger of evictions and the, the house, the, the lack of equity in housing. All of this has been really uncovered and the demand has never been stronger for, for justice, not just in the criminal justice system, but throughout our, our country. So what do I think is the most important thing? The most important thing has been the organizing that is going on outside, the coalitions that are coming together for, for justice um, that are gonna put enormous pressure. It can't be ignored anymore. 
there's an intolerance that I appreciate that has come out that says, you know, this, this isn't this kind of thing. And we've seen it, of course, in voter, in voter suppression and a lack of passage of the um, John Lewis legislation to restore the Voting Rights Act. Um, you know, this um, outside movement cannot be underestimated. So as a organizer myself, I say to people, understand your power. We cannot make any significant changes without you. That um, Justice in Policing Act wasn't on any agenda. That was nowhere. And then within weeks, the House passed a really good bill. And even the Senate passed a, a much weaker bill because of an understanding of this demand that was coming out there. So, you know, we have to work hand in hand, inside and outside inside the, uh, the, the House and hopefully, you know, we'll have more support in the Senate. Let me just say something about the Senate too, even if Mitch McConnell, all we need is for Mitch McConnell to call some of these bills and yes. they will pass because there are enough Republicans who will vote for um, these, these important pieces of legislation on, on gun violence, I believe uh, even on, on, the, on the SNAP program. On, uh, so we just need Mitch McConnell not to demand a majority of his majority, but to call some of these bills and let his members along with Democrats decide. You know, you made a very good point when you were talking about um, the importance of organizing. And so much work was done to organize, to get out the vote. But it's more than just getting out the vote. It's continuing the effort in the weeks and months ahead in order to, to really um, make the change happen. Winning elections is just step one. Exactly. Guess, no, we can't. And, and you know, I just, I wonder sometimes if there was a kind of complacency um, after Barack Obama won that you know we didn't need to be as um, a, a, as organized, and I think we paid a, a heavy price um, when Hillary Clinton was running for for president of you know not paying enough attention to the organizing aspect and getting out the the, the vote, and it's amazing actually in this in this uh, co during this COVID pandemic that these unbelievable numbers. It looks like um, uh, Joe Biden got 75.6 uh, million. It'll, probably be, it'll be more than that, closer to 76 million um, votes, the record in, in history. Um, and, um, and, and Donald Trump was second in the votes that, uh, that, that he got. Um, so many millions of people came out to vote. One, because they had the option of staying safely at home and voting by, by mail. Um, and we have to make sure that voting rights are complete. I think we need national legislation to define what that right to vote really is to make sure that every person has the opportunity to, uh, to, to cast a, a vote. I think that, should, that is on the agenda. When you were talking about uh, Mitch McConnell and re him refusing to bring um, bills to the floor, it shows the importance of uh, party leadership roles. And um, I believe in the coming week, uh, the House Democrats are going to have their leadership elections. Um, how important are those elections? And do you anticipate any changes in the leadership positions? Well, I certainly believe that our speaker, Nancy Pelosi, has demonstrated her um, brilliance when it comes to um, negotiation, understanding how to maneuver a very fraught situation and getting many achievements. I, I certainly hope that she will not have any uh, problems. I've been checking in with members to make sure that that's the case. I, I don't think that that at the uh, at the top that there will be 
um, many, many changes in, in leadership. I think they've really shown themselves as the majority um, from the, uh, the, the last midterm election um, in 2018 and forward uh, uh, ability to deal. In fact, you know, um, Donald Trump's nickname for Nancy is Nancy. He never, <laughs> that's what he calls her, you know, and she's the only person that I can uh, recall in the last couple years, uh, certainly none of the Republicans that actually stood up at a meeting where she was the, like, the only woman at the table saying, Mr. President, that is not true. And, and calling them out for, for the, the, the lies. So I think we will have very uh, effective um, leadership. I haven't heard any opposition um, yet to um, uh, our caucus chair. Um, and so I think that, uh, that he'll be there again. So, you know, the, the major um, roles, I think there, there's some, um, the openings that, that people are going to run for, all good, all good people. So I think that we're going to be, um, ha have tremendous leadership right now. Hakeem is really great at leading. Hakeem Jeffries, African-American, um, wonderful leader uh, of, our, of our caucus. So I think we're going to do, do well. And our chairman, um, um, most of them will be back. Um, and um, I think they'll the, you know, we're going to have an election in the Foreign Affairs Committee, so mm -hmm. issues um, around the Middle East will be uh, important, um, as well as everywhere in the in the world. So it'll be, um, I think, we'll be um, well led by um, the the leaders that uh, we have had and that uh, will be elected again. Thank you. That sounds very encouraging. Uh, maybe turning to a little bit more personal level, tell us how your values drive your work as a Jewish member of Congress. You know, I had the privilege on Rosh Hashanah of um, reading um, the prayer to our, uh, the prayer for our country. And I, uh, in one of the debates that we had, I did make, um, uh, I, I did use a couple of, uh, of quotes um, from that. And if I could. Oh, please. Okay. It says, God of holiness, we hear your message. Justice, justice, you shall pursue. God of freedom, we hear your charge. Proclaim liberty throughout the land. Inspire us through your teachings and commandments to love and uphold our precious democracy. So, you know, we are told, at least in my congregation, <laughs> uh, and I think in, in many places that, um, uh, oh, there was the one other sentence I wanted to read. It says, let every citizen, let every citizen take responsibility for the, uh, for the rights and freedoms that we cherish, cherish. Let each of us be an advocate for justice and, um, active, and, um, and active for liberty, an activist for liberty, a defender of dignity. So it's not only that we in Congress it's every person to take personal responsibility. I love, that's the best part um, that, that I think of, of that. It, it very much influences, you know, I, you know, I had a bat mitzvah, which when I think about it, I'm 76 years old. At the time was not all that common for girls. Yeah, that's right. Have a, a, bat, a bat mitzvah. I didn't think of it until actually pretty recently when uh, a relative of mine said, yeah, you went about mitzvah before a lot of women did. So, you know, there is this, uh, this definitely a voice in, in my head um, and in my heart. Um, and my Jewish upbringing definitely has a part to play. And so then I think maybe the flip side of that is how is an 
advocacy message perceived by lawmakers when it's delivered from a faith-based group uh, such as the clergy who are participating in this justice mission? Oh, I think it's, it's perceived well, but there is always that touch of racism that we've seen, you know, growing and anti-Semitism where we're seeing many more acts of anti-Semitism. I think overall though, in our culture, the, the voice of, uh, of clergy um, is in general respected. Um, and, and I believe very, very important that platform um, to talk about moral authority and, and what justice really, really means. I think um, that the, the, the role of the religious sector is very, very important. Um, we had a, um, a, a question submitted by one of the participants in the justice mission who I think was kind of challenging the flip side of that of um, frustration that so often the right latches on to religious messages and tries to use that as their justification for policies that um, more progressive um, uh, organizations do not do not support. Yes, I, there's that's absolutely uh, that's absolutely true. But I think that the side for real justice is prevailing and will prevail. First of all, there's so many more of us who believe who believe that way, um, and I, you know, the, the um, president elect as a um, active Catholic throughout his life. By the way, that's true of Nancy Pelosi as well. She is a devout Catholic who also um, believes certainly always in things like um, reproductive choice for women. Um, and, um, but you know, the, the, the nuns on the bus, my good friends, um, who you know, raised a, a, an important voice and certainly the clergy now that is standing up for the African-American community, for the Latinx community is um, so powerful and so important. So we can't be intimidated by, by that. We have to stand tall and, and proud and strong um, in, in fighting back. So maybe I'll um, um... Use that as a, a way to end, get to my last question. And so what challenge or request do you have for the members of the clergy uh, who are participating in this justice mission as it pertains to advocacy on hunger and social issues? We need you. We need you desperately to um, talk for um, the, first the righteousness of this cause, but also on behalf of the people that you see and that you hear about and that you know who are suffering out there right now in, in, in grave numbers, in un, intolerable numbers. Um, this mission is so incredibly important. I, I thank Mazon for taking such a, a great lead in that, for bringing together coalitions um, that will that will speak out and I know will resonate um, not only um, with the the decision makers but also to help mobilize the numbers of people the numbers of people of of, of faith and even people who not uh, who don't believe um, in in any religion um, to understand how important this this justice mission is, but often the eloquence is coming from the faith community. Um, and we need it so much now, perhaps more than ever. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you spending your time with us this morning and um, good luck in the weeks and months to come. I hope I'll be able to um, go, maybe we'll even be able to have a, a, a real, um, hunger Seder in, in <laughs> where we can come and join join each other. That will happen at some point, and I look forward to it. Thank you for inviting me. It's really been an honor, and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Wow, what an amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Schakowsky, and thank you so much, Steve. Um, I think it gives us 
amazing comfort to know that the Congresswoman is there fighting for our values, fighting to help end hunger in Congress. Um, we're so fortunate. And thank you to all of our Jewish clergy justice mission participants. Um, we're so appreciative that you've been able to join us over the past week. We hope that you've learned a lot about hunger issues, about the challenges uh, that we face in the political environment and the opportunities for us to make a difference. And as we heard from Congressman Schakowsky, the voices from clergy matter. They matter a lot. Uh, you have a moral authority. Um, you bring your community voices. You can bring the voices of those who are impacted most by these issues. I want to just remind everybody that tomorrow we will have our closing reflection with Rabbi Joel Pitkowski from Mazon's Board of Directors at 9 o'clock Pacific, 12 o'clock Eastern. And this will be a chance to reflect upon the sessions, to report back on our congressional meetings, discuss what's next for you and your communities, and for us to welcome Shabbat together. So thanks again for joining us uh, today and for the Jewish Clergy Justice Mission, and we look forward to opportunities to continue working ahead. Thanks so much.